Cerebrovascular revascularization techniques are neurosurgical operative procedures designed to augment or replace cerebral blood flow. The performance of these surgical techniques is indicated in two general situations. First, in cases in which there is an insufficient amount of cerebral blood flow due to conditions that are impairing the cerebral circulation, like Moya Moya disease or other stenooclusive arterial conditions. And second, in cases with lesions of the intracranial vessels that require exclusions of vascular segments, for example, fusiform or large intracranial aneurysms, which treatment without blood flow replacement would produce ischemia and stroke. We will first discuss the technical aspects of these surgical interventions and then their clinical applications, the evidence in support of their performance, and the future directions in validating their use. There are two general types of cerebral bypasses, direct bypass and indirect bypass. A third form of cerebral revascularization results from combining the two techniques in what is called combined bypasses. Direct bypasses are built by creating a direct anastomosis between two vessels, either extracranial to intracranial vessels or between intracranial arteries. This anastomosis can be end-to-side, side-to-side, or end-to-end -end connections. Indirect bypasses, like encephalodurohartriosynangiosis or EDAS, are built by the apposition of vascularized tissues to the surface of the cerebral vasculature using scalp arteries like the superficial temporal artery, temporalis muscle, galea, or dura mater that has been peeled or inverted. Direct bypasses are complex operations and require extreme attention to detail with a deep awareness of every movement and a step of the procedure. The selection of patients that may benefit from a cerebral bypass is essential. In the case of flow replacement bypasses for lesions that need to be excluded, like intracranial aneurysms, a careful preoperative evaluation of the images to identify the proper recipient vessels is essential particularly if planning a bypass with a combined endovascular approach in which the aneurysm would not be dissected during the bypass surgery. In the case of augmentation bypasses, evaluations of the hemodynamic status and cerebrovascular reserve of each patient are very important. Advanced imaging techniques such as positron emission tomography, single photon emission CT or SPECT have shown that measurements of oxygen extraction fraction can predict a stroke in patients with carotid occlusion. However, this has not been specifically validated in patients with Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome, or intracranial atherosclerosis. MRI and CT perfusion also have not been validated to predict stroke in patients with Moya Moya disease or intracranial atherosclerosis. However, these images are very valuable to identify patients with hypoperfusion components of their ischemic symptoms, which are essential to potentially receive benefit from the use of a bypass as a treatment strategy. The selection of the donor and recipient arteries should include considerations of the purpose of the bypass. If it is a flow replacement versus augmentation, the anatomical caliber of the vessels to be anastomosed, and the availability and accessibility of vessels. For example, for a side-to-side -side anastomosis, the participating arteries, usually picus or pericolosal arteries, should run parallel and be in close proximity to avoid tension. The use of Doppler ultrasonography to measure flow may offer a quantitative advantage in a direct bypass design. Baseline flow measure in the donor and recipient arteries intraoperatively determine if a donor is adequate to revascularize the recipient. Bleeding from a transected scalp artery represents the maximum donor flow or cut flow that must be equal to or greater than the baseline flow in the recipient vessel. This also can be used after the anastomosis is completed as an early detection tool for possible bypass failure. The following are the essential pearls in the surgical performance of a direct bypass. It is very important to prepare the smallest temporary clips that would completely occlude the recipient vessel but prevent twisting of the artery and becoming obstacles in the working field. Impeccable hemostasis is necessary to keep a working field with good visualization from the beginning to the end of the surgery. It's very important to minimize the temporary occlusion time as much as possible 
This can be held by preparing the donor vessels to be ready to be anastomosed, for example, by placing the toe and heel sutures in the donor artery before temporary clipping, by freeing the recipient vessel sufficiently to prevent tension during the anastomosis. Marking the edges of the donor artery with violet helps to facilitate its visualization, and then the donor artery can be flushed with heparin saline. Marking the recipient artery length of the arteriotomy with violet ink before the occlusion would improve the visualization of the edges after the arteriotomy. The length of the arteriotomy should accommodate the donor vessel. In general, for perpendicular anastomosis, the length is approximately one and a half the diameter of the donor. For an oblique anastomosis, it is two times the diameter, and for a fish mouth, it is three times the diameter. Once the temporary cliffs are placed, the artery is pierced parallel to its long axis with a 27 gauge needle that has been bent 45 degrees. The lumen of the recipient artery is flushed with heparin saline. The heel stitch is placed first with a fish mounted donor, then the toe stitch is placed second, followed by the back side of the anastomosis. The stitches go from outside to inside the donor artery and from inside to outside the recipient vessel. The spacing between the stitches changes from each vessel, but in general is four times the thickness of the recipient artery, which is approximately three stitches per millimeter in cortical arteries, and the depth of the bite is one to two times the wall thickness. Bite thickness is slightly less with the intraluminal stitches of the deep portion of side-to-side -side anastomosis because intraluminal suturing inverts the arterial edges. A spreading is the best presentation technique and grasping should be avoided. Tenting is ideal for presenting the wall of the vessel to the needle for the second part of the stitch. Both continuous or interrupted suturing have advantages and disadvantages and is at the criteria of the surgeon to select its favorite form of anastomosis. Knots are tied extraluminally, which means that the suturing of the deep wall of side-to-side -side anastomosis require an entry and an exit suture points to relocate the needle intraluminally at the beginning and then extraluminally to be tied. Temporary clips on the distal arteries are removed first to back bleed the anastomosis. The temporary clips on the proximal arteries are then removed. Fibrillar, no need, or other hemostatic local materials are used for hemostasis of the small bleeding points after temporary clips are removed. Indirect bypasses are less technically demanding than direct bypasses. The technique shares some aspects of the initial steps, particularly the dissection of the superficial temporal artery. General principles, like the use of careful hemostasis, are also very important. Preservation of the flow through the STA by avoiding injuries during the dissection and constrictions during the closure are also essential. Common features to perform a quick and safe harvest of the scalp arteries include the following. First, it's very important to incise the skin directly over the donor artery. Dissecting the donor artery under the microscope helps to see branches and the tissue planes in a better way. Applying upward traction on the scalp with two forceps to separate the dermal layers and subcutaneous fat from the superficial temporal artery. Careful anesthetic management during surgery is particularly important in patients undergoing these surgeries, and most published studies have similar guidelines for anesthesia. Pre-admission or before anesthesia induction, administration of IV fluids is advisable to maintain hydration while the patient is MPO. This helps to reduce the risk of subsequent hypotension. An arterial line should be placed prior to the induction of anesthesia. The systolic blood pressure goal should be set at or above the perioperative baseline systolic blood pressure at which the patient was asymptomatic. SVPs greater than 180 should be avoided. Hypocapnia induced by hyperventilation can lead to vasoconstriction and ischemia. Therefore, normocapnia with tidal carbon dioxide between 35 and 45 should be maintained. Patients should be kept Eubulimic to mildly hyperbolemic intraoperatively to avoid hypotension and decrease cerebral perfusion pressure.
direct bypass requires special considerations. Barbiturate administration before temporary clipping to induce birth suppression on EEG is important as this decreases the serial metabolic rate of oxygen. Hypothermia is not indicated. Neurophysiological monitoring with SSCP and EEG can detect cerebral ischemia during temporary occlusion for a bypass and are the standard of care in all bypass cases. Aspirin is not given preoperatively for direct bypasses, but is started postoperatively on day of surgery and continue indefinitely for life. For indirect bypasses, barbiturates and hypothermia are not necessary because there is no temporary occlusion of cerebral vessels. Aspirin is administered for at least three days before the surgery, and the procedure can be performed on an interrupted aspirin use. Manitol should not be administered to reduce the risk of hypotension and dehydration. I recommend limiting the use of steroids to only small doses as needed for nausea. Complications can occur after performing a serial bypass. In the perioperative period, ischemic events, aneurysm ruptures, seizures, wound dehiscences, failure of the bypass, and cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome are potential complications. Cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome is a particular complication of direct bypasses, especially in patients with ischemic indications for revascularization, which has been reported in up to 30% of adult patients undergoing direct bypass. The most common symptoms include transient neurological deficits in 70% of cases, hemorrhages in 15% of cases, and seizures in 5% of cases. Predictive factors for cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome include older age, more severe preoperative hemodynamic impairment, dominant hemisphere surgery, and intraoperative factors such as longer temporary occlusion time. Cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome may be mitigated with strict blood pressure control postoperatively, typically with SBPs below 130. In patients that require blood flow replacement, like in cases of giant or fusiform aneurysms affecting the parent arteries, there is consensus that direct bypasses are indicated. They can be used in combination with clipping of the aneurysm or with endovascular techniques for luminal exclusion of the aneurysm. Care should be taken to plan appropriately the bypass to ensure that the recipient vessels are the ones directly involved in the more proximal aneurysm. In patients with hemorrhagic moya moya disease, there is evidence from the Japan Adult Moya Moya or JAM trial showing beneficial results of the surgery over medical management. Therefore, direct bypass is considered the most appropriate intervention for hemorrhagic patients with Moya Moya disease, although indirect bypass was not examined in this trial. In patients with ischemic conditions for augmentation, there are no randomized clinical trials providing a definitive answer on the utility of these techniques. In patients with Moya Moya disease, there is sufficient evidence and class 2A recommendations from the American Heart Association guidelines for surgical revascularization with either direct or indirect bypasses. There is no sufficient evidence to support one technique in favor of the other one in Moya Moya disease. Most comparative clinical studies and meta-analysis based on those studies have claimed some superiority of direct bypass. However, they have serious methodological limitations that make it impossible to determine the superiority of either technique. Some of the limitations include that they have recruited cohorts of non-randomized patients in the treatment arms, in which generally patients are first considered for direct bypass, but if the vessels are inappropriate or the patient condition is more critical, then they receive indirect bypasses like EDAS. This evidently induces significant bias and makes impossible to arrive to conclusions regarding any comparative efficacy. They have also combined hemorrhagic and ischemic patients. They don't report unified clinical and imaging outcomes. They have significant time variations in the follow-up of their patients, and there is no assessments for missing data. They lack objective outcome measurements and independent blinded assessments of the endpoints. And finally, they variably included both pediatric and adult patients. Therefore, while there is sufficient evidence for surgical revascularization in patients with Moya Moya disease, no technique has convincingly proved to be superior.
In patients with intracranial and extracranial atherosclerotic stenosis and occlusion, there are two clinical trials, the EC-IC bypass trial and the COST trial, that provided high-level evidence against the performance of direct bypasses. The 2021 American Heart Association guidelines and the 2022 American Academy of Neurology Practice Advisory for the Prevention of Secondary Stroke and Management of Intracranial Atherosclerosis unequivocally recommend against using direct bypasses techniques in patients with intracranial atherosclerosis. However, there is some hope for the future use of these techniques. One pilot study and two middle development trials of indirect bypass using encephalodurorteriosynangiosis or EDAS for intracranial atherosclerosis have shown the potential benefit of EDAS plus medical management in reducing recurrent strokes in patients with symptomatic intracranial atherosclerosis. The rates of a stroke in symptomatic intracranial atherosclerosis patients were reduced in the EDAS group to 9.6% compared to 21% in the medical management group alone. This effect is more significant when subgroup analysis of patients with border zone stroke in the EDAS study were compared with patients with the SAMPRIS group with border zone strokes, presenting nominally lower stroke rates after indirect bypass to 11% versus 37% at two years. The rationale for the benefit of the indirect technique in patients with intracranial atherosclerosis include the following important points. In the extracranial, intracranial, or ECIC bypass and COST trial, the 30-day periprocedural stroke rates were 12% and 15% respectively. Beyond 30 days, although angioplasty and stenting or medical management in the numerous trials, samples, visit, or cases for these techniques have not reduced late events, bypass surgery in the ECIC bypass and COST trials reduce major strokes and death from 13% in the medical group to 9.7% in the surgical group in the ECIC bypass trial and from 21% to 6.6% in the COST trial. These gains equal rather than exceeded the periprocedural risk of the surgery, yielding no net benefit. However, even though the trials were neutral, the ECIC bypass and COST trial results provide a signal that a perfusion-enhancing surgery procedure safer than direct bypass would be a beneficial intervention for these patients. The perioperative safety of EDAS in patients with an steno-occlusive disorder has been extensively recognized, with perioperative rates of stroke and death universally reported below 5% in Moya Moya disease and 10% in intracranial atherosclerosis. There is growing evidence of EDAS earlier revascularization than previously thought over days to weeks after the procedure in patients with Moya Moya disease and intracranial atherosclerosis. This has been shown in the experimental studies by Nakamura, in the systematic evaluations of flow after indirect bypass by Ishii, and in our own results. Nakamura has shown experimental evidence of vessel proliferation with angiogenic vessel formation within seven days of surgery and identifiable mature vessels from the arteriogenesis process within two weeks. Ishii has shown evidence of a statistically significant flow improvements in patients receiving serial perfusion serial imaging at 15 days from surgery with detectable improvement after the first week from the operation. Our group has also demonstrated the presence of angiographic evaluations before two to three weeks after the surgical intervention. EDAS has several advantages in terms of safety over direct high-pressure bypass surgery, including being less technically demanding, having no requirement for temporary occlusion of intracranial vessels during the surgery, not inducing retrograde flow and thrombosis of stenotic segments, and avoiding post-intervention serial hyperperfusion syndrome.
It also has advantages over angioplasty and stenting, including avoidance of the need to cross the disease intracranial artery segments with wires and catheters, prevention of artery to artery embolism by avoiding balloon or stent disruption of the plaque, and also preventing hyperperfusion as collateral flow enhancement after EDAS is progressive and develops where the brain demands it. Based on the evidence available, the American Heart Association guidelines and the American Academy of Neurology Advisory for the Management of Intracranial Atherosclerosis recommend against routine performance of indirect bypass in patients with ICAT outside well-designed clinical trials. However, they unequivocally recommend the inclusion of those patients in phase three randomized clinical trials to evaluate the promising results of the preliminary studies of EDAS in intracranial atherosclerosis. I want to conclude by pointing out that we are developing in a conjoint effort with the NIH Stroke Network such a pivotal trial, the EDAS revascularization for symptomatic intracranial atherosclerotic steno-occlusive disease ERCES trial, which will be a phase three definitive study to test if indirect EDAS bypasses are beneficial versus medical management alone in patients with hypoperfusion symptoms due to intracranial atherosclerosis. Thank you very much for your attention.